I'd like to bring this meeting of the school committee to order and welcome everybody's here and welcome all our viewers on television and let us start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, under God indivisible, for liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Dr. Maestas will be introducing five of our new administrators here this evening. Dr. Maestas. Yes, tonight we have uh, five new administrators to the district. They are not new in new positions. They are new because of uh, retirements and people have left the district. So if possible, I'd like to have our, our new administrators come up, please. Kevin Avitable, uh, he is Alternative Program Director, Abitable, excuse me. Brian Bach, Assistant Director of Accountability and Management. Paul DeManche, he's the uh, North High School Athletic Director, uh, Robert Power, Soul Studies Coordinator, and Cindy Sylvia, she is the Korean Vocational Technical Education Director. And, so, and Cindy, we will get you a chair because we we want you to enjoy tonight. <laughs> every minute of it, yeah. Every little minute, every last second. So we, we got something, for, uh, okay, there we go. We got a matching chair for you. So, Dr. Sorensen, we have been very busy this summer hiring. Uh, Mrs. Fry has been uh, running uh, hiring committees left and right, and tonight is very unusual where we have uh, this many administrators uh, come before us at one time. Uh, we've had a very busy uh, hiring summer, and I am pleased to uh, invite these individuals tonight to um, just say a few words about uh, themselves and, and their program. They all come from a variety of different places. Um, some have been here for a while and, and, and one is returning. So with that said, if we could start, there's a handheld there, and if we want to pass it, do you want, who wants to start? <laughs> All right. So, so we'll start with Kevin. He's our alternative program director, and he's been with us for a while. So, yes. go um, ahead, sir. Good evening, everyone. Uh, like Dr. Myers has said, my name is Kevin Avitabli. Uh, I am the new alternative high school director. Uh, previous to that, I spent four years at Plymouth North High School as the adjustment counselor there, and spent last year uh, at the alternative high school in a pseudo adjustment counselor role. Um, previous to that, I also spent a year in an adjunct contract with the alternative school, so this would be my third year uh, in the alternative school setting. Uh, the goal of the alternative school, as you know, is to try to figure out a way to make uh, some of our most at-risk populations successful academically uh, and socially. Uh, so the goal is to try to maintain and to figure out uh, what that looks like moving forward. Thank you. Hi, my name is Cindy Sylvia, and I am new to the district. I spent 21 years at Wareham, um, where I was a marketing teacher and department chair, and grew a Chapter 74 program from 24 students to 310 in a school of 500. So uh, this is the first job that I've applied for, received, and changed for in 21 years because it was such an opportunity that I couldn't let pass by with all the research that I did with the Plymouth Public School System. And um, one of the most important things that I think that, that I can bring with me into this great technical program that you have here is um, an ability to bring a family together, both at North and South, because that's where both technical programs are housed. So I just saw it as an opportunity to really help do great things here in Pl Plymouth, and they've accepted me as a family member early on, so I'm excited to be here. Good evening. Uh, Paul DeManch, otherwise known as Spanky, um, and that's what I tend to go by. I come bearing gifts. I have schedules of the North Athletic Program for the fall, so I'll leave those up front for anybody. Um, I started my career way back when at Bishop Stang High School, moved on to Barnstable High School, spent some time there, knew uh, Mrs. Fry when she was Miss Connors back then, um, and also got the chance to start the athletic program for Monomoy Regional High School. Uh, when this opportunity came up, I was thrilled for it. Uh, I watched this system from afar, living on Cape Cod, but it was just an exciting opportunity. And you know what I hope to bring in this position is some stability and also to work a little bit with our student athletes. Uh, one of the things I miss from coaching is the ability to interact with kids. Oftentimes, the athletic director's position is 
making sure buses are on time, officials are where they're supposed to be. So today we had our first Captain's Council meeting and met with 24 of our, our student leaders from the fall and start to work with them about what do we want leadership to look like in our building because I'm a believer that if our athletic leaders can show the way, I think the rest of our school is going to follow. And it's, uh, it's encouraging to have 510 athletes out for the fall at, at Plymouth North. Um, it's roughly about 40% of our school, and I think that's a tremendous opportunity to, to take steps forward. So I'm looking forward to that challenge. Good evening, everyone. My name is Brian Bach. Um, prior to coming to Plymouth, I worked at Boston Public Schools as their system administrator for, uh, for Aspen SIS. Um, prior to that, I worked for the actual company Fallit, which uh, is the vendor for Aspen. I'm hoping to take the, the 10 plus years I have on uh, Aspen SIS and hopefully make it a lot easier for both teachers as well as our parents to use. I've already implemented several such things. I'm hoping that parents will notice and I'm just very uh, happy to be able to contribute here to uh, at Plymouth Public Schools. Good evening, everybody. My name is Rob Powers. I'm the new K-12 Social Studies Coordinator. Uh, I come here by way of Aponiquit Regional High School where I taught uh, social studies for the last 10 years and I was also the department chair there but also because uh, I came through the system myself I'm a 2002 graduate of Plymouth South High School I was the student representative to the school committee uh, a long time ago so um, but I'm, I'm thrilled to be back here uh, I didn't think that I would be moving into administration anytime soon if at all uh, I just I love classroom teaching and, and the magic that happens there but the opportunity to come back to Plymouth which I already knew was such an amazing uh, district and everything that's happened since I left is incredible too. To be able to come here and and give back and contribute and work with these amazing teachers was an opportunity I, I just couldn't refuse. So I've had the ability to meet with one-on-one uh, -on -one with over half of the principals so far in the district and I've met with many of the teachers including all of the middle and high school teachers and they are just phenomenal and the work they're doing is amazing and I, I can't wait to support that and also uh, offer the support necessary to take that to the next level too and I know we have uh, curriculum framework revisions that are coming down the pike uh, in social studies and I'm on that panel so uh, I hope that I can help navigate that but really the civic engagement and the social studies education is already so strong in this district and I'm looking forward to continuing that. Well, um, uh, Cindy and Paul and Kevin and Brian and Rob or Spanky if you prefer. Uh, <laughs> welcome. Hey, uh, we know you start your days very early and coming to here in the evening after a long day is probably not your favorite thing to do so we really really appreciate your being here. Uh, let me say to you that uh, this committee likes to solve problems. Sometimes we can solve them, sometimes we can't, but we like to solve problems. So as you go about doing your job as administrator, when you come across roadblocks, go through central office and, uh, and bring your problems here. We'll see what we can do for you. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out to us. Sometimes we can solve a problem. Most often not, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. May, this back to you. I just want to thank you all for coming. I, I, um, I know that going through a hiring process is rigorous and you came out on the on the positive end and we know there's a lot of work to do I know we spend a lot of time with you but um, like I've told you all um, the program is yours for the taking you have to take these programs and make them what they can and that's why we hired you and we're really encouraged by your vision and your enthusiasm to help us to make the Pullman Public Schools even a better system than what we are today. We have to keep stri striving for greatness, and that's what we want to do, and we know that you are all very capable, and I, I trust that you are up for the challenge, so thank you for being here tonight. Okay? Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Is there anybody attending tonight's meeting who would like to address the committee who isn't already on the agenda? Seeing no volunteers, I'll move on to the next item, which is our student representatives. And Isabella, can we start with you? Hi, good evening. So last Thursday, we kicked off the ribbon cutting ceremony, and it went extremely well. Over 100 people came, and we had um, different focuses on 
all grades through kindergarten to obviously high school levels. Um, Dr. Maestas introduced a variety of speakers who had an important part to um, ensure that we were able to open up the new building. And Mr. Hanna wants to give a special thanks to Ms. Fry, who he knows has worked tirelessly this summer to make this all happen. And the students are very thankful to all of you guys too to make this new school happen and give us these opportunities. Um, we had a Gold Goals fundraiser for pediatric cancer last Friday. Teachers and staff were encouraged to wear gold in support and donate money, and we raised $890 for it. Um, and we also used um, this opportunity to make a donation to obviously pediatric cancer and um, receive prizes from tech students. We are continuing to move forward with our production of Little Woman. Auditions were last week, and roles have been assigned, and it's going to be presented in fall in our new auditorium. <laughs> And then our staff enjoyed a tailgate Friday night prior to our first home football game. Over 50 staff members and their families came and enjoyed a cookout hosted by administration. And this week, after school opportunities have kicked off, Student Council, Interact, National Honor Society, and um, like chess club and everything like that all kicked off. And we have so many people staying after taking advantage of the late buses. And it's really nice to see everybody kind of getting into the swing of things in the new school. We also had a successful fire drill. It was a little bit, um, <laughs> it was more, <laughs> it was successful. We all got outside and stuff like that, but we're still <laughs> figuring out the kinks of getting through the building and the firefighters and the um, fire station were really um, helpful in trying to get us to figure out that k the kinks and stuff like that and to making new suggestions on the safest way to exit the building if there was a fire. Um, and the demolition of the old Plymouth South is starting to come to a close. We can see right through the old building to the new building, and it's so weird seeing all of our classrooms like hanging out of the windows <laughs> and stuff like that. But um, once the road is constructed through the school, the demolition will continue on the west side of the building after everything is finished over there. Um, and the public started to take advantage of our new school. So many people have came into their cosmetology programs, our tech programs like culinary, and um, numerous preschoolers have filled in the spots in our preschool section of the new school. And registration for the SATs and the PSATs took place last week. Um, our school day testing is October 11th. It's no cost to students. Grades 10 through 12 will uh, test that day, and the freshmen are going to go on the annual field trip to college campuses, so they can start thinking about that too. And we had a freshman class um, club and activities fair. All freshmen had a class meeting and they got to meet all their new club advisors if they were interested in whatever clubs they were interested in. And so um, we also had a drawing for seniors to be able to park in the staff lot last week close to the school. 20 seniors were chosen and I didn't get one if you guys were wondering. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so what we're doing is each term people who have already bought parking passes they get drawn and then those people get a chance to um, park up at the new school and or up the parking lot in the new school and we're renewing it every term to try to get as many people in to get that opportunity as possible. They're also doing during our October Fest for the seniors if you win a game you get a raffle ticket to be put in for parking spots as well. And finally the architects in our construction company continue to work on the final touches of Plymouth South and it's such an amazing building and I know I said it last time but thank you guys so much for making it happen for us. Thank you, Isabella. Let me ask you a quick question. Uh, you know how at the, uh, the building that's being torn down, how uh, that one staircase uh, by the cafeteria was always mobbed. How was the traffic pattern inside the building? So we have two huge new staircases and the back stairs aren't, like in the old school, we always used to use the back stairs and everything because the front stairs were just like gross and grimy you know we want to feel them and now everybody wants <laughs> everybody doesn't want to take the back stairs anymore everybody loves That's all the they natural want those two circular stairs. yeah so those have been working out really well during passing periods like lunch like main passing periods it's kind of congested and nobody really knows like the back stairs yet I've been using them but hopefully throughout the year people become f more familiar it's just because right now um, we know where they are they're right okay. there you right. can see them the back lot, stairs yeah. are kind of hidden more but a lot of stairs in the stairs yeah. in that building <laughs> <You've> gotta find <laughs> them. Yeah. And the yeah. <laughs> in the yeah. morning, but they use yeah. the stairs they know, and that's the, right. Yeah, happens, so. it, they're easy to see and stuff. So most people are using mm -hmm. there, so it can get a little congested. But hopefully, people, hopefully, people start using the backs. A follow-up question, mm -hmm. uh, personally, have you had difficulty traveling from one classroom to another and traveling a great distance and making it? Um, so when I have classes like gym, it's not only on the first floor; it's all the way at the end of the building. So if I have like 
like today I had pre-cal and then I go to gym so it's kind of a big hike but I mean the five minute passing period is it's a it's doable it's definitely doable and teachers are really lenient right now especially because the school is so big we're not used to it like I would go the wrong way and stuff and they'd be like why are you late and I'd be like huh? well like I went the wrong way and teachers are really understanding and stuff like that so it's been good it's definitely been doable and everybody's making adjustments at the same time so it's all understandable. Great. Thank you. Thank You're you. Welcome. Ed? Thank you. The Senior Financial Planning Night will be held on Tuesday, September 26th at Plymouth South High School beginning at 6.30. We are wishing our freshman candidates good luck, as, good luck as their peers will vote them into office on Wednesday, September 20th and Thursday, September 21st. Good luck and congratulations on a great campaign. Open House at Plymouth North High School will be held on Thursday, September 28th, 2017 from 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Parents and guardians are invited to follow their student's schedule and meet their teachers. Parents and members of the class of 2018 should visit the Plymouth North website or view the Plymouth North Daily Bulletin located on our school television for important up-to-date yearbook deadlines and information. The, the information on the Plymouth North website and the Daily Bulletin contains important information that will prevent you from missing any yearbook deadlines. Plymouth North High School encourages all students to be involved with various clubs, sports, and activities it offers. Find something that interests you and become a part of the after-school community or attend many, of our, many, uh, attend many of our scheduled sporting events and support our athletic teams. Plymouth North High School will be hosting a college visits during all four lunches. These visits are for students to speak with rep the representatives from the college or university in order to learn more about what each one has to offer. A full listing of the visiting colleges and universities and the armed forces can be found on the Plymouth North website or the Plymouth North Daily Bulletin located on our school televisions. This list will be updated continuously throughout the year. Plymouth North and South High Schools invite all college-bound students, parents, and guardians to attend this year's college fair where over 150 colleges, universities, and the armed forces will be, able, will be available to speak with. This college fair will be held on Tuesday, October 17th from 6 p.m. <coughs> to 8 p.m. in the Plymouth North High School Gymnasium. The Plymouth North Varsity Homecoming Game will be held on Friday, September 23rd at 7 p.m. against Hingham High School. Homecoming Dance is Saturday, September 23rd, students should be dropped off at 6.30 at the cafeteria entrance. Bags are not allowed and should be left at home. We, we recommend that students do not leave valuable items unattended. Life Touch sports photos will be taken on October 13th. In addition, any students needing picture retakes will be held on Thursday, November 2nd during K-Block. Breakfast is an important way to start the day and is available daily to all students from 7 a.m. to 7.20 a.m. Breakfast can be purchased in the cafeteria or gym lobby concession stands. Students who receive free lunch would also receive free breakfast. Reduced lunch students would pay 30 cents and regular cost for breakfast is $1.50. Late buses are available on Tuesday and Thursdays. Late buses depart from Plymouth North High School at 4.05 on these days. This is a great time to take advantage of staying after with a teacher for extra help or to be a member of a club or activity that we offer here at North. Plymouth North's AP, Stol AP Studio Fall Art Show will be held at Bramhall's Country Store. Opening reception is Saturday, September 30th from 6 to 8 p.m. Artwork will, will remain on display until October 5th. South Shore Workforce awarded, Plym awarded Plymouth North High School a certificate of appreciation for supporting the participants of the Plymouth Youth Work Summer Employment Program. There will be a FAFSA workshop on Tuesday, October 3rd from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. At this event, guidance departments will help parents and guardians navigate through FAFSA worksheets and answer questions they have. We encourage all families to follow Plymouth North on Twitter and to like us on Facebook and utilize our website to catch all things Plymouth North. Great report. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next item is old business. Is there any uh, updates on the old business items that are that are pending? Nothing on that. Okay, moving to the next one. Is there new business to come before the committee? Okay. The superintendent's report, Dr. Maestas. 
Yes, and I have a number of uh, items to report on. Um, this might be a, a new business item, but I'll, I wanted to t talk about it on my report, and this is relative to Nathaniel Morton Elementary School and parking. I know that every time we have a large function uh, downtown, uh, the, the Nathaniel Morton parking lot uh, seems to be uh, utilized, and um, we've had a relationship with different groups that they call the school, they call our facilities office and arrange to, you know, we're going to use the parking lot and we give them strict parameters, they're going to park in the parking lot, but uh, we had uh, a recent event downtown where um, we, we, we put barriers to, to protect the field and this one event they moved the barriers and parked on the field. So there were, they were probably, I don't know, 50, 60 cars parked on the field. And uh, this happened probably two or three years back. And, and that's when we started instituting the barrels just precautionary to keep people from parking on the grass. So what we landed up doing is we put them out, put them out every time we know there's a big event. Um, the organization that was sponsoring the event downtown, uh, they've always called um, and they've always, you know, took responsibility. They actually had people that were actually uh, monitoring who was parking there, which is something we support. Well, they were under the impression that we were allowing people to park on the grass, so they moved the barriers and allowed people to park on the grass. So the morning after uh, I found this out, I, I went down to the organization and I had a conversation with the executive director, and uh, he, he was very apologetic. Uh, there was a huge misunderstanding, but it forces, it's going to force the issue to how do we try to keep some level of, um, you know, peaceful and safe situation on that, on that property because uh, it's not monitored. Um, people uh, in the area and, and now people out of the area know that that's a prime sparking, parking spot for, for, for downtown activity. So it was mentioned in the media somewhere. I saw it that you could park it in the Yeah. Uh, it have been on Facebook too. Yeah, I think yeah. I think it's it's becoming more and more of a of a of attraction. We 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 have worked with uh, Plymouth 400 um, for um, you know like the different parades and so on, where they would have a a remote parking location like at North High School, and they do the courthouse and they do a bus from those locations. Um, but we are talking to Park Plymouth. They they um, they have a. a, a, a most people, when they're looking for a parking spot, when they come from out of town, they go to the Park Plymouth website, they call Park Plymouth, where can we park? Uh, they've reached out and, and they're interested in helping us to monitor that parking lot. The problem that we have is we really don't have any signage that says if you park on the grass, you will be ticketed or you will be towed. So um, I'm working with them and uh, perhaps bring something forward to the school committee to kind of put some guidelines um, forth because you know, even if we do put barriers and things of that nature, there is that possibility of people sneaking in there and parking on, on that lot. Um, one of the things that we, we did walk the field, uh, Gary Cost and myself, Arthur Montron and Principal uh, Spencer, about two weeks ago, the Monday or Tuesday after the event um, that I'm, I'm discussing, um, Mr. Montron's concern about putting a fence up to kind of protect that is uh, snow removal because mm -hmm. we push all the snow from that whole parking area where oh, the bus okay. is staged, the snow goes into that area. And by having a fence there or having other, uh, other boundary piece, it would really prohibit that. So we're looking at, at a solution to try to, you know, not have to worry so much about that field getting destroyed. Uh, three, four years ago, that field got torn up by uh, cars parking on that, on that field. And they, the tires sunk because the field was wet and people had to be towed out. And it was, a, it was not a good scene. Um, so we've worked on that and uh, I'll bring something forward to kind of give you some idea of ideas that we have to kind of resolve that issue. I will tell you that that parking lot has had more use in the last few years than I've seen in, in, in the many, many years before. Mm -hmm. And coming with the, you know, the, the 400th events between now and, and 2020 and, and beyond, uh, that lot is, is uh, very popular. Um, I know the Cold Spring lot is popular, the Hedge lot is becoming popular. So any spot that people know that there's a, a municipal building, uh, a public building, people are, are, are gravitating to. So the Morton is a prime spot. Mm -hmm. So okay. we'll be working on, with- On that topic. Yes. Well, so. no, I, I walked, it's 
Nathan I live right near Nathaniel Morton and Wednesday night concerts. Mm -hmm. I walked right by there and I would say every Wednesday night this summer there were people parked on the grass mm -hmm. on at Nathaniel Morton. Yeah. And that's just not you know and the the issue that we have is just monitoring right. and people respecting that. So, you know, we we discussed uh, signage if the signage is approved by school committee, uh, Park Plymouth can ticket and the tickets would they would have to settle up with Park Plymouth. Park Plymouth has an, uh, you know there's an agreement with the police department they would then have to go pay the fine to get the, the ticket removed which would go against you know uh, the registry so that is all set up but we need signage that identifies that they can't ticket it unless they've been warned mm -hmm. and it would be approved by we school committee that? so yeah. that's something that that we can consider yeah. <coughs> but I, I bring that before the committee yeah. before we do any anything. other any other uh, just a quick Mr. one. Begley. Could we maybe think of doing something with a post and chain so we could remove the chain and wouldn't be in Arthur's way, <coughs> uh, but yeah, keep them off the field the uh, when, when there's an event going on? Because those cars that were there when I was sending you the pictures for the, uh, the uh, Waterfront Festival, uh, they all had um, uh, yeah. permits yeah. in yeah. their windshields uh, for oh. vendors only. It's oh. All those cars oh. all the way back to Lincoln. So they so the, the way that the, the reason why that that went down the way that it did is uh, that's for the waterfront festival and um, the chamber um, allows and, and they've called us they we've allowed them to park um, and what we we arranged this many years ago and what they have done over the years is they staff it with three or four people and they only allow vendors to park there because the vendors unload and then need some place to move their vehicle. They issued, uh, when they sign up as a vendor, they pay their, their spot for a vendor, they get a, uh, a red uh, tag that allows them to park there and only those people would be allowed to park. The, the, the big dilemma was that they allowed people, they, they misunderstood that they can't park on the grass, they moved the barrels and parked on the grass. So that is the biggest dilemma, but um, that is something that um, they have worked with the, the school on to actually facilitate it. And but we had no idea they were allowing people to park on the grass. Mm. I was shocked because we put barriers up purposely. Yeah. Well, there was like 50 cars, so if yeah. they couldn't have gone on the grass, they would have been in big trouble. Yeah, <laughs> they well, have nowhere to park. And that's they, they had 50 cars easy on the grass. Yes, and I did explain that to the executive director, and they said that they were going to reach out to the town to try to arrange parking for vendors at Stevens Field for overflow. So their solution is to go to Stevens Field, get off that lot, the, off, the, off the grass and, and move them out. So early, first come, first serve. You know. Pretty soon they're gonna close that pass through to Stevens Field. Yeah. So that's, that's right. cut that off. So they're gonna have to drive around and then walk that's through. All the way yeah. around the neighborhood right. out to the. Mm -hmm. yeah. But, and I did. Waterfront Festival yeah. is growing huge every year. So it's, it's yeah. It's yeah. extremely busy. I mean, we, every weekend there's an event. Well, the, and even those Wednesday night concerts, yeah. 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 the amount of well, people that go, that it's crazy. It's One crazy. of the things we might want to consider is if we know, especially with 2020 coming, parking's going to be at a premium, we start doing what a lot of the homeowners do and start selling the spots. Hmm. And that way, if we have to fix the yard, we can put that into a separate account mm -hmm. and use that money to just uh, maintain the field. Um, it seems like we shouldn't have to do that, but if it's going to get to the point where the spaces are that precious, then it seems like we should raise the money to cover any expense to fix the field. You might want to consider that. Okay, moving on. Yes, I uh, just want to give everybody an update on uh, the tropical storm, Jose, that is uh, coming, coming up the coast. You know, we, we uh, anticipate tomorrow night and into uh, Wednesday we'll, we'll we'll have a, a, a large amount of rain and, and some wind. We don't know the extent of the wind. It depends on the track of the tropical storm, but it has been uh, upgraded to a tropical uh, warning, which is something that we are watching. We've been watching it for a few days now. We will definitely get rain and we will get some, uh, some wind, but uh, we will be monitoring everything throughout the day tomorrow. Um, but hopefully everything will go well. You know, we're, we're, we're concerned about the heavy winds and we'll see how, how it uh, develops. I've already told everybody who asks me, don't even think about a day off. That's right. Ah, there you go. Not this there you go. Because that, that's, three years ago oh, was the first day two, two three days ago, Friday they were asking. The first you know, day. So, 
um, your calendar um, uh, note for you. Uh, we are scheduled for a joint Board of Selectmen School Committee meeting on October 24th. And that is the meeting uh, where the students from Shishikahama are going to attend. Uh, but please put that in your, um, in your calendar, 7 p.m. Um, just to let you uh, recap, I, I think uh, the Thursday evening event, uh, ribbon cutting was, uh, was well attended. And I think we were very um, uh, grateful for the attendance of uh, our community leaders that were there. It was well done. And I think everyone that had a hand in it really did a nice job of, of pulling it off. And uh, it, was, uh, it, was, it was great to get it, uh, to get it done. Uh, it's an, a huge milestone for this community to, to have that building uh, where it is today. I'd like to also introduce Patty Breton. Hi, Patty. Hi. Patty is here tonight because Nancy is on vacation. Uh, she was going to go sailing, but I think the plans changed. Uh, they are avid sailors, and now she's uh, snorkeling. And she <laughs> Dr. Sorensen, I, she, it's possible. Uh, and then um, on Friday, the district, uh, we had the Going Gold um, fundraiser across the district where uh, we, we did a, a fantastic job. And I have to give a great deal of credit to Emily Goon. And Emily's in the crowd tonight. And mm -hmm. Emily is a, uh, a silent force in our district. Uh, over the summer, Emily brought this to, to my attention. And, uh, you know, I tell you, the, the um, support across the district for this was just outstanding. I think many people in the district felt uh, compelled to, you know, students and teachers giving, you know, pennies. Uh, Emily's probably going to spend the next few days just counting pennies and quarters and nickels, but it was a great effort and very much appreciated. I had an email from one of our uh, fathers in, in town who um, has a student that was recently, recently uh, diagnosed um, and just could not say enough about um, the efforts of the Plymouth schools to recognize a um, disease that is really um, brutal and is, is really um, impacting a lot of families throughout our community and, and throughout the area. So this does help um, families, and I think the support is, is, a, is a huge piece. And this weekend is the, um, I, I did mention it last week, and it's moving forward, and you will start hearing more. It's the, uh, the HOPE um, telethon, which will be uh, Saturday night from 5 to 9, and that is a Plymouth, a Duxbury, um, Pembroke uh, telethon to raise uh, funds for the uh, hurricanes in Houston and, and, um, and in Florida. All right. so. That is happening, and a uh, lot of uh, uh, support for this uh, for this community in a lot, a lot of different ways. And uh, with that said, Dr. Sorensen, I'll turn it back to you. All right, thank you very much, mm -hmm. Mr. Morgan. Par correspondence. Mm. Yes. Uh, there you go. Yes, we have one uh, correspondence this evening. Um, a letter from EAPC President Tom Pinto. Uh, requesting that the school committee uh, open up contract negotiations for successor agreements with the teachers, paraeducators, educational secretaries, bargaining units. Okay. Thank you on that report. Okay. So the next item is a request for a uh, for the Model UN overnight field trip. Dr. Masses. Yes. Tonight we have uh, Dave Clark is here. He is the advisor for Model UN, and Model UN is a program that we have participated in for many, many years. Um, this is a trip to Boston. Uh, the Model UN uh, field trip has happened in, in years past. Uh, they have not come to the school committee for a while, and we felt it would be important to keep that cycle of every three years, have an approval come before the school committee. So tonight, uh, you see the uh, excursion, uh, field trip excursion forum on um, the agenda. And uh, we have 18 students that are uh, anticipating going. Um, Mr. Perlow will be assisting Mr. Clark. And it looks like it'll be on the 29th of January. So it uh, looks like a great opportunity. We've done this in the in years past. 
uh, and Mr. Clark is here tonight if you have any questions for him directly. Committee members with questions? None? Okay, then we'll take a motion to approve this. Okay. Oh, Mr. Clark, I didn't see you coming up. I, I, fill us in a little bit on the field trip. <clears throat> okay. So, I've um, actually been doing the Model UN for the last 23 years, ever since I was hired at Plymouth North High School, so that is amazing to me. Um, I, the, the way it looks at Plymouth North is there are two conferences that um, students participate in. There are different kids that participate in each conference. One is called the Harvard Model United Nations. That's held in Boston. And the other one is the National High School Model United Nations, which is held in New York. I haven't done the paperwork for that one yet because I can't register for that conference until after October 1st. Um, but it's just an, an, it's an experience where you um, are assigned a country, um, and then within that country there are committees that represent the real committees of, of the United Nations. Students are assigned to the committees. Each committee is given a couple of topics to, to talk about. Um, they're real life uh, international topics. Um, they research the country, they research the topics, they are required to write a position paper. Um, they, the position paper gets sent into the conference uh, leaders who review it. Um, it's just, it's an amazing learning process. And that's just prior to the conference. And then at the conference, uh, it's a um, three night and four day conference that is just intense. They're in their committees almost the entire time. Uh, committees go. Uh, start at 9 in the morning and they go till 11, sometimes 11.30 at night, which is way past my bedtime. But um, uh, it's amazing to watch the students interact with kids from all around the country and all around the world um, and uh, really working seriously to come up with solutions to these real life international issues. And, and ultimately they are drafting resolution and they're using parliamentary procedures, so it's a very formal debate. Ultimately, they draft resolutions, the most sophisticated looking resolutions that I've ever seen. They're right up there with the real United Nations resolutions in terms of quality. Um, it's just such a rich educational experience for these kids. That's why I do it. It does involve a lot of time, um, but um, it's worth it when I hear the feedback from the kids. Some of these kids do model UN in college afterwards, or they decide they want to get into international relations or political science as a result of this conference. So it's really quite rewarding to see that. In terms of financial assistance, the conferences do offer some financial assistance through an application process. Um, <clears throat> and that we also get donations from the VFW, from the American Legion. Those donations go to help kids. The senior class helped a kid out last year. We have always helped a student who comes to me and says, I don't think I can quite swing it this year. Um, so we take kind of pride in that. Um, and then the safety is uh, something that I know there's, there's something you're going to roll out this year, which I'm looking forward to hearing about. But I think it was 10 years ago that the cell phones came out. And what a difference that made to be able to have this constant contact through texting with the kids. Uh, really made a huge difference in terms of safety. And you know, the hotel has really tight security. The conference has their own security team. The chaperones work together. There's someone out in the hallway all night long when the kids are in their room. So I really do feel comfortable about the safety. And like I said, it's been 23 years and knock on wood, everything's gone smoothly so far. Committee members? <clears throat> Ms. Badger? I just want to say that I, I think these, like you said, it does really kind of help shape you. I, we did, I did model Congress at South when I was in high school, and I, I mean that changed kind of my directory in some ways. And like, didn't I didn't couldn't speak in front of people before that. You know, I really wasn't that great mm. up even then. But then to see where that where you could do with it, and you know, we did some ridiculous thing like legalizing polygamy or something because we knew we weren't going to win and our legislation wouldn't pass. But you learn all the process and the procedures to go through it that, you know, just kind of, like you said, it can change your trajectory. And yeah. So it's a great experience. So I hope, hope you have a lot of fun. Great. Other? Okay. This is an action item. I'll move it. 
Mrs. Yeah, I'll move that we approve. Mrs. Burgess, move to approve the overnight field trip on the United uh, uh, Model UN, seconded by uh, Ms. Hunt. Question? I have a quick question. It's not about the motion, but two questions. One, first of all, I appreciate what you said about uh, providing for students who struggle financially. I'm, uh, we're, we're always glad to hear that. Um, how many students, um, we, no, 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 the students who come to you and say they want to go, where do they come from in the student body? Are they all, all within, in a particular class or just an interest? I think it's an interest. Some of them, I teach an international relations class, so some of them are naturally, I think, interested through that class because I promote it uh, while teaching that class. It's promoted by other social studies teachers who say, you know, if you, especially mm -hmm. students who really enjoy social studies, teachers will approach them and say, you got to go talk to Mr. Clark. He's got a program that I think you're really going to enjoy and you really do well at. Um, okay. I, and my other question is, is uh, do um, many of the school districts, do many of the school districts in this area participate? Uh, well, Plymouth South has a Model UN program and they have attended the New York conference on, a, uh, on occasion, mm -hmm. not every year. Um, and uh, there are some other local schools in Massachusetts that attend these conferences, particularly the Harvard one. There's a lot of Mass, you know, South Shore mm -hmm. schools that attend the Harvard one. Um, okay. But yeah, okay. I mean, it's. Any other questions on the motion? Okay, we'll take that vote then. Oh, I could use out of this. Sorry. Okay. I just got kicked out. Sorry. I, I guess I have one question. If after I apply for the New York Model UN and then I submit the field trip paperwork, do I have to, or should I come back again and do the same spiel for New York? That well, that's out of state. Um, I know it's out of state. Yes, yeah, so an out of state field trip has to come in front of the school committee. So I'll come back and do yeah, the same yeah, thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But you can tell us how well this one went. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's unanimous. Thank you very much, Mr. Call. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we have the results of the comprehensive, the comprehensive district review. Dr. Maestas. Yes, I think you remember uh, last March, uh, March 6th to the 9th, we actually went through a comprehensive district review by the Department of Education. And this is uh, performed by the Office of District Review and Monitoring by the Massachusetts Department of Education. And they looked at a variety of different programs in, in, in the district, uh, leadership and governance, curriculum and instruction, assessment, human resource prof and professional development, student support and financial and asset management. So this, this was a, a very comprehensive review by the Department of Education. They come in every few years and, and take a look at, uh, at how, we're, how we're really interpreting what um, laws are um, applicable, legislation, and also um, guidance that the Department of Education um, provides to us. Uh, there is some level of, of tie-in between the superintendent's checklist and some of the items that they look at. Uh, so there is a connection there. Um, they spent a number of days with us and reviewing um, the district. Uh, in your agenda tonight is the full comprehensive district review report, which is 78 pages. So you can take a look at all the information that they provided. And on top of that, um, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Campbell um, for the hard work that he did, as well as some of his staff to put this together because we, we, uh, they gave a sample schedule and Dr. Campbell had to put it all together and get all this set up for the Department of Education. Not only was it a schedule, but um, a, lot, a, a great deal of uh, supporting documents that the Department of Education reviewed. So they have a portal set up and a lot of documents were set up and sent to the, uh, into uh, their portal, which is secure and um, they, um, you know, they, they still ask for a lot of paper, even though that we s s sent a lot of stuff to the portal. Um, not everyone is uh, proficient using technology in that way, so they asked for uh, a number of hard documents. Um, the second document in the school committee agenda tonight is a summary of uh, the uh, review, and uh, Dr. Campbell uh, extracted 
um, the um, you know commendations and, and recommendations to moving forward. So, with that said, I'll turn it over to Dr. Campbell, and he can just walk through that table and kind of give you an overview of, of each area and um, kind of see where we are within those areas. Here, Dr. Campbell. Great, thank you, Dr. Sorensen. Um, first, I'd like to say that um, there's a lot of work by a lot of people to make this happen. And, and while the review was um, comprehensive, there's, there was nothing really that we were surprised by, which is good, because anything that was a recommendation are things that we've been working on all along. So I'll walk through those, um, spend some time on that. First, uh, leadership and governance. So if you look at the table that I put together, um, I organized it, as Dr. Maestas mentioned, some areas of strengths, areas of opportunity, some recommendations, and then some specific, excuse me, specific action steps <coughs> that we can take as a district to improve those areas, as well as the resources that are available to us that the, the department has. Um, first, under leadership and governance, they were very impressed by um, the key leadership personnel and their commitment to the fidelity of implementation of our programs and our curriculum. Um, they, you'd read that in the report. They were very impressed by um, our team, how they work together, the processes that we put in place in order to establish that fidelity and the consistency, and they recognize the effort that this district puts into that. Um, that being said, in terms of um, specific actions and improvement, they do see areas for improvement, and we, and we recognize that, specifically um, measurable goals, regardless of what those goals are, to make sure that as as district as a as a district and as school individual schools that we're looking at that and as individuals we're looking to make sure that our goals are smart the specific measurable attainable results driven and timely okay um, so as a as a district what we're doing is we continue to work on that um, first starting with our administrators when they meet with us um, for their own individual goal setting to make sure that there are specific goals that um, are grounded in student achievement um, and a that are smart in terms of measurable and attainable. Um, so we continue to do that. We continue to set up periodic reviews of those goals with our administrative team, um, both collectively and as individually. And that work has already st started taking place as early as a week and a half ago. Um, again, I referenced some resources the department has um, these are all hyperlinks. You can look at that at your leisure, but there are some great resources in terms of um, improvement planning and some tools that we can use both individually and at the district to help with that particular goal. Okay, let's take them one at a time. We're yes. discussing le uh, leadership and governance. Any committee members for questions or clarification on this particular one? Mm -hmm. Mr. Begley. I was surprised by this one because I thought we were doing a good job of syncing them up. Um, not the SMART goals. I know we always have to do a better yep. job with the SMART goals. Mm. But the idea of the strategic plan and the school improvement plan syncing yes. up. And I, I did notice, and we've commented here, that like the last two years we seem to have drifted off the mark. But, and I thought that's what they must have been talking about. But then when I looked at the date ranges they were looking at, they were looking back two years. So. So that's not it. Right. So. It, it, it's the SMART goals. It's, the, it's, it's that piece that they're very, um, the, the Department of Education is very um, adamant about goals being written in, in that SMART format, whether it's, it, you know, education about teacher evaluation, school improvement planning, it's something that they feel very strongly about. So and they didn't like the inconsistency where some schools we give them a two-year frame, some of them we give, two of them we give a one-year frame. and. It wanted consistency across the reports. Right. And we try to do that. I mean, as you know, we've, and yeah. I think it's come a long way, it certainly. Has. It has from starting with our district, uh, a district plan and really disseminating and informing, I should say, the school improvement plan. So that process, I, I feel, is good and strong, but there's always room for improvement. And, and from time to time, we do, as you said, um, make um, exceptions to the two year, um, depending on the circumstances. Um, but there's always room for improvement. I want to follow that. Up. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I want to follow the, the school improvement plans that we speak of in this in this particular goal. Uh, those those are the very stu uh, school improvement plans that we hear from the councils when they come yeah, before correct. us. Correct. Mm -hmm. And most of them, my recollection tells me that most of them have measurable goals in them because they report the results to it. Yeah. Uh, I'm getting from this that we have to refine that. Um, 
So who's going to instruct the councils on how to refine that? Well, we will. That's that's our job, and okay. we will make sure they do that. Right. We work with the administrative teams to, to then work with their councils. Yep. And I think it's really important that the smart there's a template that we can institute that really guides them so that they can make sure that it's written to the format that the Department of Education would like to see them. Uh, just like we do with my goals, they mm -hmm. should be doing something very similar. Um, and that's, I think, um, a lot of the information that they're looking for is there, but it's just not in the format in the that format. they believe right. is in the best interest for goal setting and goal monitoring. Okay. Ms. Badger. I guess uh, I don't know if this is a question for here, but uh, or just throw it out here. So, when I was reading through the 78 pages, and I have to say I did over two days because I just needed a break and to walk <laughs> away. So maybe I was missing something. But this is typical, you know, since we just got into these smart goals in what the last three years. Yeah. Is this typical of the findings that we're seeing in other schools? Because I mean, some of the language Columbus. was like really, it's, and you're just, and I, I was just reading it thinking, is this what everybody else is getting, or is this, are we off the mark really far, even though we've that's a great no, question. been that's establishing a great question. it Very good question. This is not unique to Plymouth. Yeah, certainly not. Yeah, I, I know of four districts that were going through the process uh, right around the same time we were, and the language is very similar, yeah. because it's a new format, and it's something that uh, districts are implementing at different phases. Uh, one of the things that we have really struggled with when you look at a school that is implementing a program that is a multi-year program that there's overlap from one year to the next. I think we just, if we were to give them a template that allows them to continue that trajectory or that movement from one year to the next, the goals, the measurables should change. The, the goal stays the same, but the measurables might change a little bit based on the um, movement of that particular program. So I think it's a matter of us coming up with a um, an agreed upon template that we will migrate to that will actually help everyone understand the process including on those smart goals and actually help them monitor their progress using that that tool now we're ready to move on to curriculum and instruction dr. Campbell okay thank you uh, in terms of curriculum instruction uh, they looked they looked at and observed a, a number of things they looked at all of our curriculum documents they observed in uh, approximately 100 classrooms uh, both elementary, middle, and high school, particularly math, science, English language, arts. They uh, really weren't concerned about going into other classes um, while they were here. Um, in terms of strengths, um, they recognized the, the, corab the, excuse me, the collaborative curriculum uh, leadership model that we have. Um, we're very fortunate, I've said that time and time again, to have the leadership that we have in our district for K-12 to articulation of our curriculum. Uh, you don't see that in many districts. I think it assures us that there's someone who's constantly has, you know, mathematics, English language, arts, science in mind um, and can spend their day dedicated to that, both curriculum assessment and instruction and supporting teachers through that. So we're very fortunate and they recognize um, the dedication that this district has put into that. And, 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 and as such, um, recognize that our district-wide curriculum is is very thorough, it's comprehensive, and it's timely, um, as they referenced that our science curriculum was being uh, realigned and the, the efforts that were put into that um, most recently, too. So they recognize the dedication and commitment we put into curriculum. In terms of opportunities for growth here, they really saw two things, overarching things, and in terms of instruction, which again is something that is not unique to us, and it certainly isn't something that um, we don't constantly look at is the differentiation of instruction that you're going to see in a classroom. It's really important to us um, that we continue that work. It's something that you can't ever stop doing, uh, supporting teachers and supporting our classrooms in terms of providing um, opportunities for professional development in differentiated practices and um, how to use formative assessment tools to guide your instruction in the classroom ongoingly. So that's something that we've always recognized. It is part of our professional development constantly. It's not something that you can um, drop at any time, um, and we continue to do that. Um, the second piece that, that they saw an inconsistency in is the opportunity for us to plan and schedule common planning time. Now, this is a, this is a human resource issue. It really is a matter of, of, of having the time. Of course, we'd, have, we'd love to have common planning time um, you know, as consistently as possible. Um, 
We do everything we can, given the constraints of our schedules and given the constraints of, um, the, of the resources that we have to provide common planning time opportunities um, for our teachers as, as often as we can. Some, some um, models avail itself, the team model at the middle school, for example, the freshman academy model, um, the district has made a commitment to that because they see that that's important. That being said, we can't, can, we can't guarantee that K-12 to at this point, but we continue to work on that. We continue to use the time we have, both at the district and school level, to provide those opportunities for teachers to get together as much as we humanly can uh, with the time that we have to do that. So that's something that, again, is not a surprise to us, and we continue to, to, to chip away at that as well. Okay, let's see if there's comments or questions on this particular one. Ms. Badger, Ms. Hunt, rather. Um, on the point that you just addressed, Dr. Campbell, is it that from the elementary schools, they're not getting the common planning time at all? I read into this that it was just because it varied, you know, grade to grade and school to school, well, but it, yeah. you'd think that it would have to, to fit the needs of each school, sure. but are they not getting the common planning time at all? Like, are they not getting it, enough it, it, or that they're gonna, just seeing it It's going to vary. Different. For example, at the elementary level, you have, um, as an elementary educator, you have guaranteed four preps a day. Mm -hmm. uh, in order to have common planning time, and you can look at that different ways. It could be common planning time by subject. Mm -hmm. We don't departmentalize much at the elementary. Um, it, could be it could be common planning time by grade level. And in order to do that, you have to have um, your specialists scheduled in your third grade classrooms, for example, at the same time in order no, to free your teachers. Um, and if you have five teachers, for example, and you don't have five specials, you can't really do that. Right. right? So it, it is, it's a logistical issue. It's, you know, you would have to have a, a, a number of resources available to free teachers up um, in order to do that. But that being said, we, one thing that was referenced in terms of accommodation is the professional development and the district leadership we have. We find times, we know that that is something that we can't at this time accomplish, given that example that I gave. This is why we have literacy and math coaches. This is why we have coordinators to get teachers together. It may not be looking at their planning necessarily, but it's, it's reflecting on their practices and, and giving them an opportunity to look at instructional um, models and, and, and how they can support their students. So we, whether it's our professional learning communities that are, t are building principals schedule, it's our grade level team meetings that um, principals use in, in lieu of faculty meetings or our coaching model, we find ways to make that happen. But again, they're going in, they're asking specific questions, mm -hmm. they're looking for something very specific doesn't fit the particular thing they're looking for. That's what you'd think, because it, it does seem like it would be very specific for all of the different yeah. schools. It's Mr. Very, Begley. Yeah. yeah, they mentioned on this one and in the, in the full report, mm -hmm. they mentioned in this one and in a few of the other ones that you're about to talk about, where the elementary schools seem to be closer to where they wanted them to be. They sure. thought they were doing the best. Yeah. Then the middle schools and then the high schools last. Yeah. And the high schools were off by quite a bit, like in the 60% area did, did given the explanation you just gave yeah. do we have more of a resource issue at the high school because of the high school schedule I don't or? think it's a resource I think it's the, the classes that they observe when you go into an elementary school and you're observing at a particular time they're all teaching language arts at the same time so you're going to see that consistency if you go into a high school and you're varying you may be in a number of different classes so you're not they didn't necessarily uh, what they observe at a, at a high school is significantly more varied than what they're going to see at an elementary school in terms of the but classes they went into. That would be consistent across all school districts. And, and they pointed it out as, in other words, they didn't, in the full report, they don't mention that as if that's a norm. Like, you know, we expect this when we look <laughs> at right, no, elementary I, sure. level. We expect because of the scheduling differences, <laughs> they didn't seem to weight it in any way so it seems like they thought that this was above Thank you. you know beyond the average or something that they pointed it out I'd say that we are we certainly have made a, um, in terms of language arts and mathematics with the coaching model that we have we certainly have put a lot of energy into that curriculum yes I want to follow that up because I, I particularly concerned about the use of the word rigor mm. 
in that particular area of growth. Uh, and I interpret, I don't know how to interpret rigor. It seems to me that they give the feeling with using that word that the, at some point in the district, at, in some classes, it's the, the, the education is too loose. That's how I interpret that word rigor, and, and maybe I'm wrong. Could you comment? When I saw the word rigor, I comment, I, in my mind, I'm trying to figure out what they saw what, or what they didn't see. And that's one thing that um, we, we need to try to understand a little bit better. I, I do, I've done a lot of uh, um, evaluations of schools, and rigor would imply that uh, there's, in this particular uh, review, that there's inconsistency on how the curriculum is being addressed with a high level of um, differentiation and a high level of um, addressing the high end of the curriculum so that kids have the opportunity to be able to be challenged. And I think um, I was curious as to uh, where they saw that. Was it what type of classroom uh, did they visit uh, to be able to determine the kind of class it was and the, the type of students that were in the class? So, um, you know, it, it's something that we're going to continue to look at, continue, continue to look at to see. Um, you know, how we can uh, address that issue. I think it's important for our principals to take a look at this to see uh, how internally our schools can, you know, start taking a look at some of this. Um, but it is something that did uh, uh, pique my interest when I read it. Keep, it, keep in mind, um, we got this report about uh, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, uh, for a first draft. Uh, we then had the opportunity to comment on it. They gave us about a week. We didn't, um, we didn't challenge anything in the report uh, because this is obviously, obviously a, a group's uh, uh, observation and recommendation. And we, we decided as a, a group to take this uh, as written and to, to work off of what was demonstrated through that evaluator's viewpoint. And, and we will continue to do that. Very good approach to it. Okay. Uh, can we move off curriculum and instruction and move on to um, Human resources. Professional sure. Development. If I could just make one comment about the um, sure. curriculum instruction before we move off. One thing that we started last year, and I think I brought up to the committee last year, um, is instructional rounds where we have our administrative team working in small teams across the district, going across all of our schools, going into classrooms and reflecting on practice um, and rigor relevance. Um, Student understanding, student engagement. These are all these are all f focus areas of inquiry that we're doing, and then bring that back to our administrative team to talk about how can we support teachers to continue that work of rigor relevance um, um, with our teachers. So that's something that we're constantly working on. Okay, thank you. In terms of human resources, again, this is not something that um, was a surprise to us. Um, the f the first the area of strength that they saw was that they were very impressed by the comprehensive nature of our professional development programs and support. Um, they recognize that we offer a significant amount of professional development, not just during our early release days and full day, but um, the coaching that we do and how we utilize our meetings at the building and, and district level. So they were very impressed by that, um, had a lot to say about that. The piece that um, they certainly see as an opportunity for growth, which again is not unique to Plymouth. This has been an issue, I think, since the implementation of the new instrument um, is our education evaluation system. Um, to be completely um, honest, it's a very, very um, tedious and cumbersome process for our administrators, it's a, it's a lot of work. You could have dedicated people doing it all day long. Um, it's, a, it's a very, very um, intense time, um, intensive instrument, um, but we continue to, to work on that. And I know that Mrs. Fry has, has, has done a number of things in her short tenure here as well. And I don't know if you wanna say um, something to that. Yeah, the interesting part when they arrived is I, the evaluations they were reviewing were ones I was writing as a principal because they were from the prior years. And I think um, to credit the administrators in the district, it, as Chris said, it's incredibly cumbersome. Well, the shift went from uh, the cycle change to an every person on all the time, which is 
obviously fantastic, but I think the best parts about it are the SMART goals and the conversations that happen between administrator and teacher, or whatever part of the um, school community. But the tricky part has been when you have a district our size and you have, we have 50 different administrators, so to speak, writing these documents. So when I read consistency of supervisory practices, we're working together this year on how to have some consistency amongst a math coordinator versus an elementary principal, because we all share these evaluations. So, um, and I think when what they viewed was our former system baseline edge, which had a lot of, a lot of idiosyncrasies within it, and we've been fortunate that we put that into Aspen. And I know in speaking with all the principals and coordinators, it's much more fluid and easier to, to accomplish, because it is an enormous, enormous task. But they, they understand the priority, and this year at the retreat, we came up with some strategies to try to ensure that all the, the there's more consistency, honestly, um, because sometimes the, the energy is spent on an employee who needs a lot of help, and you want to really make sure even the superstar teacher is getting as consistent a message as the one you're trying to work through and get them to the next level of instruction. So, um, but it is, I think the Aspen model that we're using is much more fluid, and we rolled that out last, last year, right? Last yeah. fall. Yeah, the management system. Sorry, I started that last year. The management system was was had a lot of flaws. A lot, to say the least. So we started that. We we're thrilled with. And then our Aspen has been great. We Brian, our new Brian. Um, we started our hiring is also through Aspen, which is kind of neat. So, but that is something that every administrator knows that we're still. It's the consistency, and we've had training. We had so much training when it started, but I think we can revisit it again. And right. And train for one thing that this district does, which a lot of districts don't do, and you should feel good about it. Quite honestly. Um, all of our new teachers um, within the first few years of their contract go through a Research for Better Teaching RBT course. Um, at the same time, all administrators in this district go through the Observing and Analyzing Teaching course, which aligns with the RBT course. So the language is common, the training is common, the expectations are common, so that we're all speaking the same language. So the new administrators you said saw here, um, we'll go through that training as well, and all of our other administrators have gone through that training. So again, as Mrs. Fry said, it's continuing, it's honing those skills. And the department does have um, some resources that are uh, availed to us, which we can use as exercises when, when meeting together as an administrative team. And I think the challenge for me this year is to look at if you have Hedge Elementary and Mrs. Wilson is the main evaluator. She's really the only one who, with her small staff, but then when you have one of the high schools, you could have a principal, a coordinator, a department head, so it's getting all those cooks together. And we don't spend as much time with the vice principals, so that's one thing, I, it's one of my goals this year to spend time with the vice principals to get them some of the messages that we share at principal meetings, if that makes sense, to kind of to keep working on it together. Mr. Begley. So, um, just so I'm clear, so then when they did the analysis, yes. they did not look at the Aspen version that we have. Oh, and they actually had us print out every, it was interesting, a piece print. of paper. So paper. it was the prior yeah. system, the baseline edge. So the second part here you've already done because yes. we've got Aspen coming up mm -hmm. and running. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we rolled that out works, last year. Works, works was totally that good. Year. So they were referring to the old they process. They wanted to look at the old system. Which yeah. is good to hear because this one yeah. surprised me because I thought yeah. we were way ahead of the curve on this. When We've the done training. We did this yeah. full day training before we even instituted yeah. it. Yep. And we shared our new system, but they did say to me we want to focus on the prior. So Good. Any other questions on the Human Resources Professional Development Goal? Okay, moving now to... Um, St student support. Yes, um, in terms of the strengths, um, the, they recognized a, a number of strengths. Uh, first, our, the programmatic resources that we have for our struggling students, they recognize um, through whether it's our school psychologists, school adjustment counselors, um, the availability of the, the collaborations we have with outside agencies within our district, um, as well as our alternative program at the high school. Um, they recognize that, that this district has committed to supporting struggling students, um, both their academic and social emotional needs. Um, they also recognized um, the the attention to student safety that this district, um, you know, has in has in place. Um, they're very impressed by um, the work that's done through the safety committee, uh, the commitment that we have as a community to that, and the measures that we've taken place as a result of those meetings and conversations and the work that comes back here. So they were very impressed by that. In terms of um, academic support, uh, th we've talked about this for a long time and we continue to work on this. You've, you've heard us talk about, um, excuse me, um, RTI, 
um, response to intervention. Um, they're looking for something that's perhaps a little more formulaic than we have in writing for them. Um, but we certainly um, continue to work on this in terms of our coordinated systems of tiered intervention. Um, so what are the universal systems of progress monitoring and intervention that we have for all students? And how do those interventions um, increasingly um, become more intensive as we um, have a student that's perhaps struggling both academically and behaviorally and emotionally? So while the systems are in, pl are, are in place, we certainly have room for improvement and we recognize that and we continue to, to do work on that. Um, we, we're doing some asset mapping within um, my office and looking at some of the things that we have both particularly in language arts and mathematics um, but also looking in other areas in terms of our behavioral and mental health needs um, and we continue to work up that as well and looking at ways of assessing and monitoring students in, in that regard. So um, some of the recommendations they had there is to continue to hone your system of tiered interventions and supports um, which we certainly agree with. Okay, let's discuss this one. Uh, my response to this one is, uh, when I first read it, I said to myself, we have tiered intervention. We, we, I could name the programs. Mm -hmm. we, yeah. But I think this is one of those things that you could have 100 programs, look at the needs of the children and say, well, you need 110. I mean, you could always fit another tier in between. So we'll never, you never reach this goal, but I'm, I'm glad your response is that, well, we'll continue to refine because we can build in more tiers mm -hmm. depending on the needs that we have at any given moment. Yeah, it's certainly something that we have to continue to evaluate and to, to, to progress monitor ourselves in terms of how we support our kids. It's, it's you can't answers. really end this work. I think one of our challenges in the district with any program, uh, I'll use RTI for example, uh, is really the understanding of all our staff in the district on the resources that we have that actually fit into each of those tiers and communicating that we have new staff that come in uh, we have s staff that get transferred from one grade level to another M might have different uh, pieces that they need to to be aware of but for us it's it's that constant you know you can't just implement you have to continually have that refresh so everyone understands exactly what our model is um, and we've been working on uh, the RTI model um, format, uh, you know, quite some time. Stacy Rogers has been, you know, although it's not necessarily a special education piece, it's more of a student support um, overall learning piece. Uh, Stacy's been very involved with really trying to help us determine the district model of, of intervention in these mm -hmm. different tiers. So I, I think we've put a great deal of effort, but again, mm -hmm. it's one of those areas where uh, we will always be working on uh, these different levels. And it's something you that's- know, You know, reminded me of something when you said that, that at first it was saying, you know, we need to educate new staff and staff about the tiers that we mm -hmm. have, that's important. And as we educate them, we also have to educate them as to what's an inappropriate recommendation. Absolutely. Because we have recommendations coming from one level to the next, the kid ought to be in this program, but that's an inappropriate that's recommendation. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. And, you know, one of the things that we have to be aware of, and, and that's where our professional development comes in, is, you know, when a re recommendation does come in, that when does it change based on what resources are available, mm -hmm. and also um, when does it phase out completely? Because a lot of these interventions are, 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 are not lifelong interventions. Right, right. You know? Right. Okay. So that was the major point they were trying to make, just so I'm clear, because I followed up on some of the resources like you have at the bottom here and in the full report, and when you open them up, it says the RTI right away, and I'm like, well, we have that, so uh, they got me totally lost, and then I went back and I reread that part, and it seems to me the bigger gripe was that it was just the consistency it was being, not that it wasn't being done, it's just it wasn't across consistently One thing that I, I failed to say, which I probably should have said before, we've been implementing uh, RTI practices well before we were using the term RTI. So we've had a lot of interventions in place within our district well and people didn't realize that it was RTI. So we haven't used that language really until fairly recently. So if you're asking a, a teacher Sorry. perhaps um, about mass tiered inter systems of intervention, they may look at you like they don't know what they are. But if you talk about it in terms of, you know, do you have universal screenings and progress monitoring and what systems are in place, it, it all really depends on how those questions are formed because 
we, we do. We've been doing uh, quite a bit for quite a lot of long time, but we haven't used the word RTI or mass tiered systems of support necessarily um, in this district. So, you know, we're working on a, a um, global sort of position paper for people to understand that so we can advertise that to the community at large and that will be helpful to new teachers. Um, but it's, it, it's, again, it's one of those things that we continue to work on as a district and to support new teachers in place so they know the tools that are available, they know the resources that are available to them so that they can make good reflective decisions when, when, when supporting kids. Anything else on student support? Okay, financial and asset management. Yes, um, here, um, happy to say there were no recommendations, no opportunities that they could recognize for growth. I, they were very impressed um, <laughs> by the planning documents and, and the, digit, the district's <laughs> budget super. process, um, <laughs> the transparency <laughs> to all the stakeholders within the district. Um, and the constructive relationship that um, this board and this school administration has with both the town officials and all the agencies with, within the community of Plymouth. So uh, they were very impressed by this and, um, you know, give Mr. Costin and his team a, a lot of credit for, for um, highlighting that for them. Growth opportunities. <laughs> and Mr. Costin, I, I, I bet you they're amazed. I bet you this team was amazed that they came into this district and they couldn't find area of growth recommendations. They were hoping, but. Because I'm sure <laughs> they find it. If we had the state auditor here maybe two or three decades ago. The state auditor came to Plymouth and looked at the books, and it was a big problem. So this is amazing. Dr. Mastis. I, I don't know how many of these reports I've looked at over the years, but I don't, I don't think I've ever seen any area that did not have a recommendation. So, you know, I, I think it's, I, I would say that it really has a lot to do with um, the interpretation of what's expected by the Department of Education uh, and also within the regulations that are set forth for financial management in the school district. And I think Gary has done a fantastic job to interpret that, interpret it, what it means to Plymouth. But on top of that, one of the things that Gary implemented when he first came on board is is we do our own internal auditing, which really helps to make sure it's not necessarily auditing that, you know, all the all the pennies are in the right spot, but making sure that we're in compliance with state regulation. So, in my view, if they wrote something that was negative or something that was a recommendation, and we had a, an audit that gave us a differing opinion, I, I we'd have to take a look and say, well, who's right and who's who right. Mm -hmm. So I, I do give a, a great deal of credit for that proactiveness. Um, by uh, Mr. Costin for really, I mean, how many times do you open up the newspaper and, and see uh, inappropriate uh, financial, uh, you know, dealings within a school system and happens across the country. Uh, and I think that one of the things that Gary is very diligent about is making sure that, that we follow the letter of the law and I think this, this document supports that. Any, any comments on this last item from committee members? Congrats. Yeah, absolutely. Mr. Mann, absolutely. Big. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> right. Can I make one <laughs> Thank you. If I can make one comment. Um, I, I appreciate all the, um, uh, the support uh, of the school committee and uh, recognizing, you know, how hard, and we use the term, we work. Because it is, it's not just me, it's my office staff and it's all of us uh, sitting at this table, how we've worked on the budget, the budget process. I think that's something that they were very uh, impressed with and uh, how transparent the budget is. Um, and I think we should all take credit with that. Uh, as far as following up with our pra practices and process, one of the things that, that we've done in our office is we've taken all of our staff and we've run, run them through the MASBO training program for support staff. And that's, that's a, uh, I think it's 12 hours of contact time and with homework. And, and a process that they have to, uh, to work on. One of the things that they did, and this is my staff, and, and I have to give them a lot of credit, and uh, is, again, it's not just me, is that we developed a financial procedures manual. That was the goal of that, um, of that process. That, that was the outcome. We used an outcome-based uh, program. And we've developed that process, that manual, and we continue to refine it. Um, so I think, I think Again, I appreciate all the comments, but I, I really, uh, hopefully they're watching tonight at home, that they would um, 
they would uh, take this as a compliment to what they've done. Um, they're, they're a great team that we have. And the other thing is that this, the committee has uh, supported our budget requests for uh, continued auditing that we do, not only internal but outside auditing, that we have uh, CPAs come in and we audit some of our accounts in addition to our uh, student activity accounts. And that has been a huge help to us. Um, as you know, sometimes when you're working on things, you can have blinders on, but you bring in uh, objective uh, observers and uh, technicians, and they pull apart what we're doing, and they make suggestions. And we constantly, you know, look at we can, we're improving our practices all the time because we're certainly, certainly can improve. So I appreciate, I appreciate the committee support also. And we truly appreciate you and your staff because yeah. you saved us from a problem here. <laughs> Believe me. Okay, that was a great report. Thank you very much. And, and the same for assessment as well. We had. Um, sorry, say that again. One assessment. More. Okay. assessment. One District more. assessment okay. too was okay, the last sorry. category. But again, uh, no recommendations here. They were very um, impressed by the balanced systems of assessment um, that the districts and school staff use to inform curriculum instruction and provide intervention for struggling students, which gets back to the RTI model, to be quite honest. Uh, but they were very impressed by the systems in place and the balanced approach that we have and the commitment that the district has in this regard. Hmm. Any questions on this last one on assessment? No. And this was this was also Karen's organization, right? I mean, with Karen the, uh, is the <coughs> or the um, Aspen. She's a the Aspen. That last Aspen. sentence, yes, the the department to manage the data. Yep. They seem to like that. That's yeah. Okay. Moving on now. Reports and proposals from committee members. Ms. Badger. I just wanted to say that um, the South Open was just wonderful. I, I took a video of the, I forget what you called the, <laughs> the kids and everything. Everybody, I showed it to people at work. I was like, you have to watch this. You have to watch this. And I made everybody watch it. And everyone was like, that is such a great idea. You know, you, you see what all parts of the community. And, and, and then I, you know, talked to some other people in the gym who were just so impressed by the presentation, impressed by the tour they got of the school. I know I was, I got a tour. Uh, I couldn't make it to the, the ones we had during the summer. And it was, it was really nice. And the student knowledge of everything from, why there's a um, the science teachers have their own um, prep area and just everything they knew so much about the building itself the heating system and just it was pretty it was awesome if I can should just to credit Dan Riley because the way those tours yes. happened they were obviously Gary's idea to have the kids and I met with Dan and explained what the why of why the door we learned from North opens to the, all the little things yep. and Dan taught those kids and they had scripts and they were I think they were the best ambassadors possible and the embracing the future I think we called it I will never work in an elementary school because <laughs> those kids are, they're amazing but they <laughs> bounce around I belong with high school <laughs> age as you can tell from my <laughs> six-year-old but God bless those they were wonderful little students but teaching the little biomedical girl to say she's amazing shape you can they were unbelievable I was in a sweat watching them go so but they were incredible but, but Dan really trained those kids and did it all some the, the tour guides other uh, reports and proposals from committee members okay we just all went to the ground we all met last done. week oh, right, right. <laughs> okay uh, PYDC anything to report um, I couldn't go. Nope. No. Okay. I'm happy to speak. Yes, Do you mind doing that? Not a problem. It was last, we had it, it was last Friday. We just had the meeting last Friday yeah. um, at the hospital. Um, Gary welcomed everyone and gave introductions and, and um, then first spoke about uh, the prevention partnership with Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital um, and also introduced Dr. Nate Hurwitz Willis, who is the new director of the Department of Public Health here in Plymouth, okay. who so we're very happy. Um, very happy. Dr. Maestas um, reached out to him and gave him a personal invitation to come to the committee. So it's really nice to have him um, in his role at that committee. So we welcome um, Nate to the conversation as well. Um, shortly thereafter, we spoke about um, the SAPC, the Substance Abuse Prevention Collaborative. They will be having a regional meeting here in Plymouth at the New Recovery Center on Obery Street. Um, that will be September 26th. 
Uh, I don't have the time, but I can certainly get that to anyone who may be interested. It will be an regional, evening. It will be an 26th? evening. September 26th. Because I got a regional meeting that was in October at the recovery center. That's different? It, it could be a different uh, okay. one. No, yep. Oh, all right. Okay. But we can certainly get that information to anyone. 926 at, at uh, where? It's at the new, the, the new center on Obery Street, the new. Oh, uh, at the recovery center. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, I thought it was later than that, and that the re the reply <coughs> date was the 26th. If you were coming, okay. Well, I will double check that, yeah, yeah. Margie, okay. and get that information to you. Because mm -hmm. I did get the invitation. Today we just came today. Okay, okay. I'll have to check that. Yeah. Okay. Um, Maybe there's two different things. I guess. It could be. We also had um, Pat Nevins, who is from the district attorney's office. He was a, a great support to me and to a number of us as we worked on the grant application for the Drug Free Community mm -hmm. Grant. We should find out um, September 29th, I believe that's the Friday, right? Okay. September 29th, whether or not uh, we are awarded that grant. So I'm hoping at the first October meeting that we have good news to share with the committee regarding that. Uh, that being said, regardless of the, um, the status or the outcome of that grant application, we do have a one-year plan um, as a committee, uh, PYDC committee, in terms of uh, <coughs> focus areas. Some of them obviously would be easier to do with the grant funds than, than not, um, but we walked through that briefly and spent some time talking about that one-year plan, particularly about outreach and how to help with some of the initiatives around drug, alcohol, marijuana use, and, and opioids within the community. So we spent some time on that. Um, Judy Vigna, who is the um, chair of the Healthy Plymouth, uh, spoke briefly. She is um, going to be stepping down from the chair role of Healthy Plymouth, certainly not going away, but stepping away as the chair, chair role, and will be co-chairing with Melissa Kenny uh, for the next few months as she transitions into that role. So we're happy to have Melissa Kenny on board. Um, the, and then lastly, we spent a few minutes, uh, tr Principal Trina Camaro, um, we may have mentioned that we started a childhood, child and behavioral health subcommittee of PYDC, and, and Trina is instrumental in chairing that. So she gave a, a brief update um, where they really haven't met much since uh, the summer, uh, just where they are in terms of initiatives, um, looking at um, seeking grant funds to support some of the work that they're doing. And there's a Chana grant that they're looking to seek uh, to help with some of their, uh, with some of their initiatives. And that's all I have to okay, report on Thank that. you for that report. Any questions? Ms. Hunt? I don't know, if we, at PYDC, did you talk about this weekend is the healthy, um, the oh yes, the amazing, amazing race. race. We certainly did. Yes, yes. Well, the amazing race. Um, it was a lot a going on that day. Yeah. Amazing race is happening this yeah. Saturday. Only um, Leah and I were available, so I might volunteer if they need me. In that's the great. Uh, they absolutely. If you just show up at Nathaniel Morton, I'm sure they'll find. Yeah. yeah. Judy will certainly put you to work. She's. Oh, yeah. She's. Yeah. she's uh, you walk there. She has a sure. gift. With, <laughs> I in put that a regard. message into, into Wendy to see if she needed me. I was available. Yeah, Wendy's great. She's been a great support on this too. Yeah. So the amazing race, which is a fundraiser for Healthy Plymouth and Derek Cure and the work that they've been doing will take place uh, from 1 to 4, starting at Nathaniel Morton this Saturday, ending at Nathaniel Morton, much like the show from years ago. Um, there'll be different challenges across the Plymouth community, and there'll be um, at least two volunteers at each station to, to, to man the challenges and to see who comes in first. So it should be a good, a good time, and there's a celebration afterwards at Nathaniel Morton outside. No one will be parking on the grass either. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? No. Okay. Uh, we did not have a building committee. We have one coming up on uh, Thursday. Yeah, it was because of the uh, groundbreaking. groundbreaking. We were all there, so we couldn't go to building committee. So now the so next item is homeschool uh, plan approval. Yes, tonight we have 10 homeschool plans that have been reviewed by Dr. Halpin's office and, and do meet the guidelines set forth. Uh, for approval. I recommend approval of the 10 plans within the school committee agenda this evening. I'll make the motion. Mr. Bagley moves the recommendation of administration. Ms. Burgess is the second. Are there any questions on that motion? Okay, we'll take the vote then. Oh, there it is. That's mm -hmm. unanimous. Thank you. 
Accounts payable warrant. Ms. Hunt. Okay. I might read off of there this time. <laughs> what do you need? <laughs> um, let's see. Do you want no, my, I just, I, I think I, I think I'm too blind and I have my screen too big. So you can't read this one either? Yeah, no, I can. Okay. It's just smaller. <laughs> to receive, <laughs> whereas school committee members have been provided with a copy of the cost center. Yeah, see, you're cut off too. Um, cost Center Transfer and Transaction Summary Report and the Warrant for Review, I move that the Plymouth School Committee accept and approve the Report and Accounts Payable Warrant number S092117, dated September 21st, 2017, in the amount of $1,036,388.61 as presented. You've heard the motion, seconded by Ms. Madger. Question? Okay, we'll take the vote then. That's unanimous, thank you. We have minutes of August the 7th. What's the pleasure of the committee? Ms. Badger? I'm wondering when they were posted because I read these, I think I looked at it Saturday morning and I, uh, Sunday morning and I didn't, I didn't have me. I read them minutes. this morning, but I didn't read them. Yeah, they were. I, okay. I think they were. I, Why, is that a problem, yeah, you think? I just. She hasn't read them. I haven't read them. Oh, you haven't had a chance to read them? No. Uh, oh, and two of us have to abstain, so without your vote, we're not going to pass those minutes. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't see them. So uh, we'll bring them audits. up another minute, another, another, another meeting. Next meeting. <laughs> August the 19th. Can you note that? Same Patty? thing with August the 19th? I didn't yes, have any it's minutes. the same thing. I thought it was weird. <laughs> committee want to hold them as well till the next meeting? Sure. Okay, we'll hold both sets of minutes for the, okay. for the reason given. Obsolete equipment then. Yes, tonight we have some uh, obsolete equipment uh, that uh, looks like we are discarding. And this is a, a GE dryer, and its electrical board went out on it, and it's more expensive to fix it than to replace the dryer. This is at Plymouth North High School. I recommend disposal. Ms. Badger. I, I, um, oh my gosh, I move that we approve the, the disposal of the equipment from Plymouth North. Okay, uh, Mr. Let's Morgan, is the second on that one? Hold is there on a question second. to that one? Can you, uh, okay. Ms. Badger, Mr. Morgan. Uh, let's take that vote. Yeah, it's coming right now. Yeah. No, hold on. Well, that went by, and I didn't even see if everybody voted, but you got yes, everybody? Okay, wow, we really. Mm -hmm. All right, <laughs> got to be quick around here. All right, uh, books, obsolete books and materials. <laughs> yes, we have uh, Federal Furnace Elementary School, and we have uh, three different items that are um, outdated and are going to be discarded and these are testing protocols. I recommend approval of this item. You've heard the recommendation? Ms. Badger? I move that we approve the disposal of the Federal Foreign Elementary is there, School. Is there a second? Ms. Hunts is the second. Are there any questions on this motion? Okay, we'll take the vote then. Yes. Oof. Oh, did it fast. Yeah. yeah. That's great. That's unanimous. Is there any other business to come before the committee? Seeing no hands, then we stand adjourned at 8.30. Thank you very much.